Good, thanks. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today are some results from a, a very prototype experiment um, where we're attempting to use ambient noise, ambient seismic noise, to measure shear wave velocity in slope sediments. Um, as we've seen from many of the talks this morning, uh, shear strength is a, is a key parameter in models of failure. Um, and so if we want to study land size and understand the potential for failure and, and what it might take for land size to be triggered, we need to uh, understand what shear strength looks like and how it might change along the slope. Um, one of the best seismic methods we have for getting at shear strength is to measure shear wave velocity. Um, we can, um, well, we'll talk about shear wave velocity in a second, but first of all, we can actually measure shear strength in cores uh, more directly. Uh, so this is an example from the uh, ODP borehole uh, to the south of Hudson Canyon, where we have a shear wave measurement extending down to about 600 meters uh, below the seafloor. And so this tells us a lot of information, but it's a lot of information about a one particular uh, place in space, but also in time. Um, and so to, 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 to characterize uh, uh, mechanical properties, namely shear strength of, of sediments over wider areas, people often appeal to measuring um, a shear wave velocity through seismic methods. This is one of the more advanced um, shear wave generators that's, that, that I'm aware of from the uh, Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. And so this device actually sits on the seabed and um, has a ram that rocks back and forth at a prescribed frequency and causes the, the instrument to, to, to um, to, to, to uh, rock back and forth and, and generate shear waves. Uh, you can measure those shear waves on um, ocean bottom instruments, such as an ocean bottom cable or ocean bottom seismometers, and then use the arrival time of, of, these, um, of surface waves in those data to constrain shear wave velocity as a function of depth. Um, so the basic idea is that interface waves of different periods are, are sensitive to um, different uh, to velocities at different depths. That is, low frequencies or long period waves are going to feel much deeper depths than uh, than high frequency waves. And so you can look at the change in velocity as a function of frequency on plots like this to model velocity as a function of depth. Um, and so our question is, can we do this with ambient noise? Uh, that is, can we use uh, uh, surface waves, interface waves that are excited by uh, background noise uh, to constrain shear wave velocity? The, uh, briefly, the, the idea of ambient noise is that if you record a, a random noise field at two different receivers, the cross-correlation of that random noise, noise field uh, should be maximized at a lag time that corresponds to the travel time of the surface wave between those two instruments. And so we, uh, we set out to, um, to test this idea, to see if we can actually do this at a high enough um, uh, frequencies um, and therefore high enough resolution to actually um, give us a constraint on, on shear wave velocity in sediments that, that are prone to failure. And so this is our site to the northeast of Hudson Canyon, which is offshore of uh, New York and New Jersey. Um, we put out uh, 11 uh, short period ocean bottom seismometers in a very tight array, so this is one kilometer, so the maximum offset is about, is about two kilometers. Uh, these are uh, our, our short period um, instruments, so they're sensitive to higher frequencies than, than uh, instruments used to record um, uh, global seismicity. Uh, they had uh, three component seismometers plus a hydrophone. And this is what some of the raw data look like um, from, from that experiment. Um, so this is, this is actually an earthquake that we've recorded, uh, and, and there's actually a, a poster this afternoon that looks at more of the, the earthquake data. Uh, but in this study, we're not interested so much in, in, in signals like that. We're, we're looking at the noise, so we actually cut those uh, earthquakes out of the data. And this is what uh, some of the noise correlation functions look like, um, plotted here for different pairs of instruments at different offsets. And so you can see a, a few key things in this plot. One is that there's a lot of energy arriving at uh, travel times corresponding to about 1,500 meters per second. So this is a, is a water wave. But out here at longer offsets, or at longer lag times, um, we have this, this uh, slower traveling phase that's traveling at about four or 500 meters per second. And this is around where we expect the shear wave velocity to be uh, for, for marine sediments. And so what we think we're looking at is, uh, is surface waves uh, traveling between those instruments. We can, um, we can look for dispersion by uh, filtering those, those noise correlation functions to, to a series of narrow bands. So this is at 3 hertz, so fairly low frequency in our data set. And then we can increase that uh, center frequency and see how those arrivals move in time. 
So plots like this uh, sort of summarize what I was just showing. So this is now lag time uh, and frequency, and you can see these different arrivals. So in here at these um, short times or, or these water wave phases, um, but out here at this 500 meter per second time, you see this, this other phase that actually uh, changes with frequency. So, so it's, uh, we can say that it's dispersive. Um, we can get a better handle on what that is by converting time to velocity. So now we have velocity on the y-axis and, again, frequency on the x-axis. And you can see these peaks in energy um, at different velocities and frequencies. And so we can, we can uh, forward model um, what we would expect this uh, velocity as a function of frequency or dispersion to look like for a very simple uh, VS profile derived from uh, uh, P wave speeds. And so this is, again, just a very simple 1D model. It gives us these. These are the first four um, modes of a, of a Schulte wave or an interface wave. Um, and you can see a couple of key features here. One is that the, uh, oh, the main feature is that the velocities at low frequencies are much higher than they are at high frequencies. And so, again, this is, this is going from um, waves at low frequencies that are sensing uh, these, these higher velocities at depth to really uh, short period waves that are sensitive to these, these slower velocities up by the seafloor. And so we can do a much better job of fitting those data if we, if we do a bit of modeling. Um, and so this is, a, this is a preliminary model, and it's just for one pair of instruments. But we can do a decent job by just lowering these, these, these velocities up near the seabed. Uh, we can do a decent job of fitting this fundamental mode and also this, this roll off to higher frequencies at depth, or to, sorry, higher velocities at depth. Uh, we can also do a decent job of fitting the uh, second and third uh, modes of the surface wave. And so, so now we have this, this, this uh, it's again a preliminary model, but we have a, a, a model of, of VS as a function of depth, and we can compare that to MCS data that we have um, through the same array. So this is a, I'm going to show a line, this line here, and the pairs of instruments that are, I've been showing the correlations from come from this north-south line. So this, again, is our VS profile as a function of depth compared to a depth-migrated uh, reflection image. And you can see that this, this nick point here, where we go from these slow velocities to, to a higher velocity, um, lines up very nicely with, with this booming reflector um, and, and maybe some of these other, uh, what are still coarse uh, boundaries, um, maybe line up with some of these other reflections. Again, this is all pretty preliminary, but I think we can say that we're, we're able to resolve or we're at least sensitive to velocities in the upper 100 meters of sediments. So this is an area that's, you know, these, that's the sort of scale of sediments that are failing in landslides. Um, we can, one of the exciting things about ambient noise is that you can uh, potentially resolve changes in velocity through time. Um, and so you can get at that with plots like this. So this is now group velocity on the x-axis and day of the year on the y-axis. And these peaks are, are where, um, where we have energy at certain velocities. And so if, if velocities were changing through time, these peaks would be moving back and forth. And at 5 hertz, so again, these are, these are waves that are, are, are feeling um, uh, relatively larger depths, um, these velocities are not really moving and they're fairly, fairly constant. Uh, but if we go to higher frequencies, we start to see some, some wiggling around in these peaks, suggesting that maybe velocities are changing. Of course, um, Ambient noise, uh, has, there's a lot of other things that could influence this, such as variability in the ambient noise field. And so we have a lot of more work to be done to actually say, is this just error at those frequencies, or are we actually looking at, at changes? But it's tempting to say that as you, you know, increase to higher frequencies, we have more variability. And so maybe we're actually looking at um, fine scale velocity changes uh, uh, with time. And so. Anyway, so I'll, uh, I'll wrap up by saying that this is a very preliminary uh, data set um, or, or result, but I think we can say that uh, short period OBS data can be used to recover high frequency noise correlation functions. Um, these data that we've been looking at uh, appear to record Schulte waves, and, and they're dispersive. Um, and we can use this dispersion to constrain shear wave velocity as a function of depth in the upper hundreds, uh, uh, tens to hundreds of meters in marine sediments. Um, furthermore, I, I think, again, the more exciting thing about this, these kind of data is that these noise correlations may be able to resolve temporal variations in shear strength, but we have a lot more work to do before we can say anything conclusive about that. So. Thank you. We have time for questions. Is 
Yeah, so Hurricane Sandy is within the deployment, but we haven't really looked at that in detail. And so, yeah, so storm loading may be something that we could, we could um, see in these kind of data. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're working on that, but I think, um, I think that plot that shows where, where you have to reduce uh, velocities is, is, is pretty telling. If you compare that to, say, eigenfunctions as a function of depth, uh, it's around that same range for these frequencies, so about 100 meters uh, with, um, you know, I, I guess I won't quote what the resolution is between, you know, uh, grid sizes there, but, um, but we're sensitive to velocities in that upper 100 meters.